Good morning. Thanks for joining us for Mobile Church this morning. Right off the bat, I just want to start with an announcement, a really exciting announcement. So almost exactly a year ago, I stood up on this stage and we had our benediction and there were a, a bunch of us in here and we sang a song together and I didn't know that was what was going to happen. I didn't know it was the last time we were going to be together in person for quite a long time. And over the last year, we have been submitting to the state laws, leaning on the side of safety for the sake of the vulnerable, listening to the science, and we haven't been meeting in person. Been waiting to find out what we should do. Recently, the state laws changed, and we had a conversation last week with the high school, and I'm happy to announce that we are officially going back to in-person gatherings starting on Easter, April 4th. So, there's a lot more details. But for now, I just want you to know, we are planning everything and we are excited to see you in here for limited capacity gathering in person on April 4th, Easter. If you don't have the app yet, please get the app. If you don't get the email yet, please subscribe to get the email because we're going to be laying out all of the protocols. We're gonna have uh, the way that you come in and take your temperature and the mass and all that stuff. We're gonna lay out all those details for you. But the short version of this announcement is simply, we're going back to in-person gatherings with limited capacity starting on Easter. So mark your calendars for that. All right. I'm like shaky. I'm excited about that. <laughs> and now I'm going to transition over to a kids ministry video where we get to see Josh Anderson and his family, I guess, enact some Star Wars stuff to teach us about the Holy Spirit. So let's watch. I'm really excited to be sharing this kids moment with you. And I don't know about you, but I am a huge fan of this movie that maybe you've heard of called Star Wars. It's actually nine different movies that we get to enjoy, and it's a series that I have enjoyed when I, since I've been very, very young, and maybe you have been too. So I want to hear right now, I want to hear your best Wookiee, or maybe your best Darth Vader or maybe your best lightsaber sound, or maybe your best phaser sound. Oh, that's Star Trek. Anyway, let me hear it, right? One, two, three, go. Awesome, man, those are good. I know that I spent a lot of time trying to perfect those noises. I'm a little rusty now, so I, I won't put you through that. But what I love about movies like Star Wars is that they trans you to this time that um, seems so magical this time that um, you know is kind of a disconnect from the reality that we are a part of every day of our lives and there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of action and intrigue and adventure and so I love that I find myself even now I watch those movies as a way to kind of recapture a lot of my my youth and yet I know that when I was younger I would be disappointed because like with Star Wars I wanted to be Luke Skywalker and I wanted to be able to lift rocks and to lift starships just with the wave of my hand and realize that I didn't have the power of the force in me but what I wanted to share with you this morning is that there's actually I think a connection between Star Wars and the Bible. And again, what I love about movies like Star Wars is that they actually help me better understand things in the Bible that seem so foreign or so ancient or so difficult to understand. And so what I mean by that in particular is, if you remember in episode four, New Hope, there is a scene between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader when they are dueling it out. They have their lightsabers out and they're fighting. And you can just tell it's Obi-Wan Kenobi is overmatched. And he is he is no match for Darth Vader. He is much older now. His powers in the force maybe have faded a little bit. You can just tell that he knows that his time is drawing to a close. And he says something in the midst of that that I find to be so intriguing. He says, strike me down and I will become more powerful than you could ever imagine. It's a, it's a quick 
line, it's a quick scene, part of the scene, you can easily overlook it. And yet there's something really powerful about what he says. And I think that line connects interestingly with what we know in the Bible. In particular, it's what Christ says about the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you've heard of God the Father, and you've heard of God the Son, but we don't talk a lot about God the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've heard of it as the Holy Ghost. Maybe you've heard of it as the Advocate, or the Counselor, or the Helper. Maybe you haven't heard much of it at all. It's this kind of mysterious thing that maybe has been referenced along the way, but you don't really know what it is. Well, I want to share with you that I think much like Obi-Wan Kenobi talking about his being struck down that he would become more powerful, Christ does the same thing with the Holy Spirit because he knows, he knows that he will be going to the cross, that he will be dying for our sins, but he also knows that he will be resurrecting and that his death is not the end of the story. In fact, it is the continuation or even the beginning of something new. And so what Christ understands and what God knew at the very beginning is that he would have a specific time on earth that he would walk with us, that he would be with us, that he would heal us, that he would teach us, that he would really work to transform our hearts. And then ultimately, he would go to the cross for us and he would defeat sin and death for us. But that is not the end of the story, nor is it the end of the gift that he has given us. Because what he has done is he has left us his Holy Spirit. He recognized that he was confined by a human body, but that as the Spirit, he can be anywhere, every, everywhere at any time. He is no longer confined. And so when you and I say yes to Christ, when we follow Christ, when we become followers of Jesus, we in turn receive the Holy Spirit. We're told that in the Bible as well. We receive the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit enters into us. And so you could say that the power of resurrection itself enters into us. And so it may not feel the same or be the same as lifting rocks or lifting starships or any of that kind of stuff, but it is a power that is eternal. And it is a power that allows us to have an intimate connection with God in unique and special ways. So when we are troubled, we have a comforter. When we are struggling with a decision, we have a counselor. When we are unsure of what direction to go, we have an advocate. When we don't even know what to say to God, when we struggle to put words to the feelings that we have, we have someone who is able to interpret those groanings and be able to tell those things to God himself. And so really, you and I have great power because of the Holy Spirit. And we can take a lot of hope in that, a new hope. And so we have something to look forward to that is not make-believe, but is very real in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hope, and I'm going to guide us in a mindful moment. <clears throat> well, this week we were asked to study and read and contemplate Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And I just have to let you know that I feel really underqualified to talk about this. Because um, I still have a lot of forgiveness to do. And we talked about how these Beatitudes build upon one another. So I still have forgiveness to do. And because I have forgiveness to do, my heart's not pure because I carry around that baggage. And I talked to somebody on the phone this week 
they're a chaplain and they said, you know, hope you can't hurry forgiveness and when it comes it'll be right. And that was a really big weight off my shoulders. Um, and besides when I think about peace, you know what I feel? I feel angry. So how can I talk about being a peacemaker when I feel angry when I think about peace and making peace? Well, I'll just let you know the reason why I feel angry is because I think that peace is really intertwined with justice. And if you've been paying attention, there's a lot of injustice, not only in our country, but in the world, so many other countries. And you can't really separate peace building from the promotion of justice because it just undermines both of them. Do you know the 20 most peaceful countries in the world, according to the Global Peace Index of 2020, are Iceland, New Zealand, Portugal, Austria, Denmark, Canada, Singapore, Czech Republic, Japan, Switzerland, Slovenia, Ireland, Australia, Finland, Sweden, Germany, Belgium, Norway, Bhutan, and Malaysia. We have such a great country, why aren't we in that list? So with true transparency, I did all of this research and all of this study on how those countries are peaceful. And I'll just let you do your own research because this is not enough time to tell you. But since I don't really feel like I can talk about <laughs> being a peacemaker, I'll just use the words of some other people. So I found this TED Talk. Um, a man from India, his name is Kala uh, hold on, I'll start over and say it again, Kalash Satyarthi, and the name of the TED Talks was How to Make Peace, Get Angry at Injustice, and I thought, oh, okay, I think I can, I think I can listen to this one and maybe find something that uh, applies to me. Well, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014, and this is what he said. He said, if we are confined to the narrow shells of egos and the circles of selfishness, then anger turns out to be hatred, violence, revenge, and destruction. And we know what that looks like here in our country. But if we are able to break the circles, the same anger can be turned into a great power. We can break the circles by using our inherent compassion and connect with the world to make this world better. And he said, you transform your anger into an idea and your idea into action. And then another man that I came across, Ellie Wiesel, and I found him on a website called myhero.com. Well, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986. And he lost his mother and his sister and his father in the Holocaust. And he wrote a 900 page book entitled, And the World Kept Silent. And he said this, Indifference is more dangerous than anger and hatred. Indifference can be tempting. More than that, it can be seductive. It is so much easier to look away from victims. It is so much easier to avoid such rude interruptions into our work and our dreams and our hopes. It's after all awkward, troublesome to be involved in another person's pain and despair. Yet the person who is indifferent, his or her neighbor, are of no consequence. And therefore their lives are meaningless. They're hidden or even visible. Anguish is of no interest. Indifference reduces the other to an abstraction. 
Indifference is not a beginning, it is an end, and therefore indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never the victim. Indifference, then, is not only a sin, it is a punishment. I had the blessing, the gift, to go on a high class Sunday with Bailey Cook, who I met through the spiritual, what, our spiritual formation groups here at the heart. And we were having this great conversation, and I was telling her how I just didn't feel like I could talk about peacemakers and peace. And she said, you know, I think a lot of people who were huge makers of peace didn't really have peace themselves. And I thought, yeah, I think you're right. Here's a list of people that were assassinated for standing up for human rights. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Viola Layuso, Mark Harvey Milk, John Lennon, Marsha P. Johnson. So let us not shy away from our anger. Let us not be indifferent. Let us lean into our anger and let it transform into action. Let us step out of our comfort zone. Christ asked his followers to die to themselves, to take up their crosses and follow after him. Taking up a cross and dying to self are not comfortable. That's not a comfortable action. Christians should always be willing to step aside their com- out and get out of their comfort zones into any situation God may place them in. And God has placed us all here in this moment in history, in this country. And what are you doing to step out of your comfort zone and get angry at injustice? Let us breathe together. So close your eyes. And pay attention to your breath. Place one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly. And in your mind's eye, see yourself in those places that are not comfortable. See yourself making those sacrifices for change. Gently open your eyes. And I'm going to leave us with a quote from Anne Lamont. Seeing is a form of pure being. Unlike watching or looking at, seeing is why we're here. Good morning. Thank you, Jason, for the exciting news. Thank you, Josh and Ella and Ruby for Star Wars and the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Hope. Um, So guys, we're going to sing together apart, but we're going to sing together nonetheless. So if you join me in prayer, God, we crave your peace. We want it so bad. And you teach us it's something that 
we can experience in part in the here and now abiding in Christ, and yet it whets our appetite for a fulfillment of that peace that the world would experience the way uh, it, it was meant to be, the kingdom of God. So God, sharpen our desire for peace this morning as we sing and meditate on the active and future peace in you. It's in your sons that we pray. Amen. Is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, or quiet streams. Death and die. I will not fear for you are with me, you're always with me. Shepherd staff comforts me. On my feast in the presence of enemies, surely goodness will follow me, will follow me in the house of God forever. In the house of God forever. I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, a quiet street. House of God forever. In the house of God forever. In the house of God forever. Tempted and tried, will off me to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Why there are others living around, never molested, going along. Father, along, will know all about. 
farther along We'll understand why I Tear up my brother Live in the sunshine We'll understand it All by and by Sometimes I wonder Why I must suffer Go in the rain The snow and the cold when there are many living in comfort Giving no heed to all I can do Father the last trumpet sound in the sky then we will meet those gone on before us then we shall know Is all understanding. Ooh. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Ooh. Trust Him with all your heart. Good morning, church family. If it's your first time joining us this morning, uh, I am Erin Duell. I am actually the worship director here at The Heart, and we've been playing a little switcheroo on you this morning. Don't know if you've noticed. Uh, Jason, our teaching pastor, gave the welcome. 
Josh, who's our community life pastor, gave the kids message. Ethan, who's our kids director, our next generation's director, led worship, and here I am teaching. Something that feels oh, uncomfortable for me, but uh, I'm gonna go for it. I've been entrusted with the honor of teaching on our next passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. So before I get into it, um, I would love to just pray for us this morning as we enter into this conversation. So would you pray with me? God, we acknowledge what Hope said that peacemaking is so hard. It is not our instinct and we need you. You are the bringer of peace. You made peace. It's what we were meant for. And so God, I, I ask that you would stir something up in all of us. I know that you have stirred something up in me as I've been preparing really long before I was ever asked to do this teaching. We need your wisdom. We need you to help us to search our own hearts, to recognize the ways in which we have moved against peace and the ways that we can move forward in peace. So God, be, be with us in this conversation. We, we want to learn from you more than we want to learn from me. How do we love you? Amen. I am painfully aware that there is an endless well of wisdom and revelation to explore in each one of the Beatitudes. And this one little sentence packs so much weight that I feel like I can't do it justice and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of all that there is to glean from it. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peace makers. Not just those who love peace, not just those who are peaceful, not those who keep the peace, the peacemakers. A few years ago, I was at a gathering with some of our interns, and really, I don't even know what we were talking about. I don't know what the topic of discussion was, I don't remember anymore, but our beloved intern, Hannah, was telling us a story about a moment that one of her mentors asked her this question. Are you a peacekeeper or are you a peacemaker? And for me, who tends to be non-confrontational, it was just one of those, oh snap, that was a really good moment. So I wrote it down and it has stuck with me ever since. It's the only thing I remember of the whole conversation. So it begs the question, what is the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker? And to answer that, we gotta talk about what peace actually is, because how can we keep it or make it if we don't even know what it is? So what's the first thought that comes in your mind when you think of peace? Hope shared that hers was anger, <laughs> which is so different than how I normally think of it. For me, I think I most often think of it as a feeling, um, this a calmness, a sureness, a restful feeling or state, and an absence of inner turmoil. And I admittedly have used it myself almost exclusively in the context of feeling a peace about something, like a decision in my life, feeling like I'm on the right path. I feel assurance and, and trust. Or 
I think of it in a political context when there's a peace between nations, and that's a much less confident kind of peace to me. It's more about the absence of, of violence. And then there's the peace that I imagined is reserved for the end, that heavenly peace we'll experience when we're face to face with God. And all those things are true. All of those things are indeed valid kinds of peace. But I, I know that it's not the fullness of what peace really means. You know, making peace politically, uh, in that context, we're talking more about a truce, a ceasefire. It's, it's the kind of peace the world gives. It's one that is only good until the next thing happens or the trust is broken. It's, it's unstable, it's not lasting, it's temporary. The other two feel a little more spiritually valid because they do rely on God to bring forth that peace. But when I think about what it might mean to be a peacemaker myself, that definition doesn't really work. And I know it's not the fullness of how I'm supposed to understand peace. I can't be a maker of that kind of peace. And it seems to revolve a lot more around a circumstantial feeling. Fortunately, scripture talks about peace a lot. The Hebrew shalom and the various forms of that word are used 550 times in scripture. And we have the Greek form of the word irene. Am I saying that right? Someone tell me, maybe. Is used 94 times. So as one does, when they know they have to give a sermon about something, I got into the definition of the root word shalom. And it's so good, it's so good. And here's a bit of what it said. This is from Strong's. Means to be safe in mind, body, or estate, to be made complete, to be friendly, and to reciprocate but it gets better. Shalom also means to make amends, to finish full, to give again, to make good, to repay, to make prosperous, recompense, to make restitution, to restore. And isn't that so much more rich and full than a feeling, than a calm feeling? this shalom kind of peace actually seems to me to not be about a feeling at all. Maybe the feeling is really more of a side effect of true peace. Shalom is actually about restoration and wholeness, particularly relational restoration and reconciliation, which is a word we really like around here. So now that we know better what peace looks like, let's take it back to the question of the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. So I'd like for us to look together at Ezekiel 13. Now for context, Ezekiel was a prophet during the time of Israel's exile, the Babylonian exile. And at the time, even though they had had plenty of warning about what might happen if Israel continued to be unrepentant, the people of Israel were still left trying to make sense of what had happened to them and how they ended up here. And there were those at the time who were preaching messages of hope and peace. You know, don't worry guys, God's got us. He's gonna bring us victory. He's gonna bring us peace. And I mean, that doesn't sound that bad, right? Times are tough. They're trying to keep people's spirits up and they're seemingly still relying on God to be the bringer of peace. I mean, that doesn't sound too off to me from some of what I hear now. Well, here's what God has to say to them through Ezekiel. He says, your prophets, Israel, are like jackals among ruins. 
You have not gone up to the breaches in the wall to repair it for the people of Israel so that it will stand firm in the battle on the day of the Lord. Because they lead my people astray saying peace when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is gonna fall. Rain will come in torrents and I will send hailstones hurtling down and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where's the whitewash you covered it with? It's a metaphorical wall, as far as I know. God says that their messages of hope and peace are false. They're lies because they aren't acknowledging the things that are broken and need to be repaired and restored. Peacekeepers are concerned with placating. Peacekeepers tell people what they want to hear to make them feel better at the moment. And it really does, it feels good. And it looks pretty. It looks hopeful. But it's a temporary peace. Calling on peace when there hasn't actually been any kind of a restitution or amends or repentance. In reality, all that is is slathering some plaster on a wall and calling it good. There's a psychology word that describes this spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing is an avoidance technique. It's when one uses spiritual tactics to avoid or deny uncomfortable emotions, experiences, or realities. And it's human nature to do that, but it's a corruption of our faith and what we're called to do. True peace doesn't just happen. It, it doesn't just happen with time. It doesn't happen by avoiding hard things. It doesn't happen by ignorance, by shifting blame, by leaving the past in the past. Peacemakers don't bypass hard things. They are willing to take a hard look at what is broken and they don't just call it out. They're the ones willing to take the steps to repair it, even on another's behalf. If we look at the prophets of the Old Testament, they were willing to repent on behalf of their nation's sin and previous generation's sin. And doesn't that sound a lot like what Jesus did? Repairing what he did not break on our behalf. In John 14, he says to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. But he doesn't leave it there. After the resurrection, after he has demonstrated what peace even takes, which is sacrifice, he says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Ooh, that's like a really uncomfortable amount of power for me. But do you see how crucial our role is in bringing shalom to the world? It's not just on God. He put it on us as well to walk in his way. And we are so individualistic. We think everything is just between us and God. I was always taught that I am responsible for my own sin, for my own mess, for my own, you know, part in, in my salvation but to be a child of God requires that we participate in the process of reconciliation of all people and all things. Lisa Sharon Harper says it like this in her book, The Very Good Gospel. 
The peace of self is dependent on the peace of the other. God created the world in a web of relationships that overflowed with forceful goodness. These relationships are far reaching between humanity and God, between humanity and self, between genders, between humanity and the rest of creation, within families, between ethnic groups or races and between nations. These relationships were very good in the beginning. Then the story of the fall explains how the relationships were broken. The rest of scripture takes us on a journey towards redemption and restoration. Shalom is the stuff of the kingdom. It's what the kingdom of God looks like in context. It's what citizenship in the kingdom of God requires and what the kingdom promises to those who choose God and God's ways of peace. So how do we make this kind of peace in all of these relationships and all of these connections? And I think the really good news is that it's not on each of us individually, but it's on us collectively to participate in together. And I don't, I don't have the answers to everything, but I, I do want to give you some practical thoughts on what it might look like for you to pursue, pursue peace in these different areas. So first I want to talk about pursuing peace between humanity and self. Look at your own house. And can I encourage you to not just look for the cracks, look at the whole thing. Where do you see good? Where do you see potential? Where do you see the image of God in your own being? Because if you can't see it in yourself, how are you going to recognize it in others? And also, Let's take stock of where the breaches are, what's broken, what is in need of repair in ourselves. And let's know also that making peace with ourselves means acknowledging that wholeness and healing are possible for you. And after you assess where peace needs to be made, what can you do to make it happen? Has your own sin broken you? Do you need to repent? Or maybe shame has broken you. Maybe it's time for you to forgive yourself. Maybe it's time to believe that God, the creator, created you and called you good and he made you for wholeness and that you are worthy of healing. Or maybe, on the other side of things, you've whitewashed your own self-image. Maybe you've convinced yourself that you have nothing to repair, nothing to make peace with, because you've slapped some plaster on your brokenness and called it a day. So wherever you may fall, and maybe it's a combination of, of all three, May you ask God to search you and to know your heart, to test you and know your anxious thoughts, to see if there is any offensive way in you and to lead you in a way that lasts, that truly lasts. And one more recommendation I have in this area that I don't know if we talk about it enough in church and encourage it enough in church, but if you have access to it, get therapy. It's so important and if you don't have access to it, find someone you trust, who loves you, that you can process with and assess with, who can help you make peace with yourself. Iron sharpens iron, baby. We need each other. And if you haven't realized yet, this is not all on you alone. We are interconnected. We need each other even to make peace with ourselves and our own humanity. So the next hopefully practical pursuit is interpersonal peace. Peace between families, between friends, 
And I'm not just talking about figuring out who the one person is who wronged you the most and reconciling with them. Yes, that's super important too. Um, I don't, every situation's different. There's a, there's a, a million sermons about that. But I am talking more about day-to-day -day peacemaking and maintenance of peace in your relationships day-to-day. -day. The year I graduated college, I, um, I somewhat accidentally <laughs> moved into an intentional community out in Todd with four other women. And <laughs> yeah, it's still an active intentional community and it's wonderful. Um, but I was in the first group that really did not know what we were getting <laughs> into. And I can tell you that it was not all sunshine and rainbows. It was really hard. It was one of the hardest seasons of my life, but I learned so much about the difficult beauty of making peace regularly. Every Monday, we had family dinner together and we all provided for it. We cooked together, we ate together, but our conversations at dinner had two regular things that you know, at the beginning of moving in together, we agreed on to do at family dinner. And one was to go around and talk about our high and our low of the week and just, you know, support each other in, in both of those things. And that was nice. The other one was the airing of grievances. And I, I hope that you're thinking about Seinfeld right now. <laughs> it's a Festivus tradition but I would not recommend waiting yearly to do it. Um, in my experiences with family, with roommates, with marriage, with growing up in the South in general, passive aggressiveness reigns as the way that we deal with things. And really it starts with good intentions. It's attempting to just let things go. It's trying to not cause drama or be confrontational. We're taught, you know, don't be a drama queen. Um, it starts with trying to give people the benefit of the doubt, really, which is all fine until it's not anymore. <laughs> and the little things that we've let slide, we've let it slide one too many times and those little things turn into big things. And those big things turn into value statements about people and we start reacting out of bitterness and resentment. And family dinners taught me a valuable lesson about repairing relationship early and often before it leads to resentment and before that resentment leads to broken relationships. And it was awkward sometimes and it was hard, but I know that it's what was meant when we are called in scripture to as much as possible live peaceably with one another. And now the airing of grievances might not be a practice that you have agreed to do regularly with someone, that's fair enough. Matthew 18 gives us a very practical guide for how to do this and how to approach restoring relationships with one another. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I have a really hard time with that language, but to express that last sentence in a more practical way for us here in 2021, we're gonna call that boundaries. Isn't that interesting? There is scriptural basis for having boundaries. It is part of the peacemaking process, but there's a correct order for this. You do what you can to make it right between you first. Don't just slap plaster on it. Don't call it boundaries if what you're really doing is avoiding an uncomfortable situation and you're trying to sidestep. Make peace, repair, and how you do it matters. 
Galatians 6 says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Please tell me one time that you restored relationship really with anger and with sass. And I'm preaching to myself right now because I can be real spicy with my correction. (laughs) Don't be spicy. Don't be like Aaron, don't be spicy. But I also want you to consider what you might do if you're the brother who is confronted. Because we're good with this passage when we're thinking about ourselves as the victim. What if you're not? What if you're the perpetrator? What do you do if someone calls you out? So let's go back to the beginning of that part. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Listen. Listen first, listen to understand, not to respond, not to defend, not even necessarily to agree. It's so hard, I know. And it takes so much practice and so much humility and I'm still learning how to do this. Open your heart up to enter into the discomfort so that you can make peace so that you can make things right. You will mess up in this process. You will mess up sometimes. Keep trying. Learn to repent, learn to forgive, learn to repair. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is a toughie. And I will admit right now that I I really don't have (laughs) all the practical answers that are needed to this one. We're talking about larger scale shalom, peace between genders, peace between ethnic or cultural groups and races, peace between nations. Do you recognize that there is currently a lack of peace between these groups? Do you recognize that there are still broken relationships and lingering pain and injustice stemming from generational sin in all of these areas? I really hope so. I really hope you're aware of it. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of division in our country. There's division in our communities. And a lot of it, I believe, is stemming from whitewashed walls that were never properly repaired that are starting to crumble from the rain, from the wind, right in front of us. And people are saying, like in the passage, where's the whitewash you covered it with? We have inherited the fruit of generational sin and instead of sidestepping and shifting cause and blame, we need to be the ones who are gonna begin to repair or continue from those who have already begun the process. What are some areas that you've seen this? Personally, I have been on a journey for the last few years um, through an involvement and and Be the Bridge um, to, to learn more and enter in to the conversation about racial reconciliation. And I have been learning to listen more to the stories and wisdom and experiences of people of color, and in particular, the black church who has been speaking out about unrepaired walls for years. And in that journey, I have had to come face to face with my own pride and with my own entitlement and with my own feelings of offense at hearing things that I just didn't know and didn't feel like my fault. It was really, there was a lot of things that were really uncomfortable for me to hear, uncomfortable for me to try to understand. But I've been learning how to listen and listening to understand has been changing me slowly but surely. It's humbled me. It's made me more empathetic to experiences that that I haven't had. It's made me aware of little things, just little 
assumptions, little biases, little transgressions, and little things that I can do to help bring restoration to groups of people in tiny ways. Can do it in choosing where to give money and time, in how I buy, in whose voices I'm giving my attention and honor to, in how I raise my son to view people, in how I participate in community, in how I view policy that might affect someone in a different way than it affects me. And in all those little things, they don't bring shalom in and of themselves. There's no quick fix to this kind of brokenness. There's no easy reparation. But when we do little things collectively over time, making peacemaking a lifestyle, making repentance and reparation a daily habit, we are slowly working to bring about the shalom that is described in scripture. The shalom that doesn't avoid because it's too overwhelming, that doesn't deny, that doesn't spiritually bypass. The shalom that makes amends, that repays, that repairs, that completes, that makes creation whole and healed. And when we do this, It's like a fountain that spills over and over and we become experts at learning to recognize more breaches, more places that need repairing, more people that need healing, more and more until that person is reconciled with that person and that group is reconciled with that group and the beautiful web of relationship that God made and called good is restored and we know shalom as it was meant to be. I wanna end our time with this quote from Common Prayer, Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. Peace is not just about the absence of conflict. It is also about the presence of justice. Martin Luther King Jr. even distinguished between the devil's peace and God's true peace. A counterfeit peace exists when people are pacified or distracted or so beat up and tired of fighting that all seems calm. But true peace does not exist until there is justice, restoration, forgiveness. Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice and the act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. Peace is about being able to recognize in the face of the oppressed, our own faces, and in the hands of the oppressors, our own hands. Peace, like most beautiful things, begins small. Peacemaking begins with what we can change ourselves, but it doesn't end there. We are to be peacemakers in a world riddled with violence. That means interrupting violence with imagination on our streets and in our world. This peace that is not like any way the empire brings peace is rooted in the nonviolence of the cross where we see a savior who loves his enemies so much he died for them. Peace is often not our instinct which is why it must be cultivated and grown in us. Oh, so before we close in a time of worship, I want us to pray together and to read as our prayer, the prayer of St. Francis. So would you read this with me? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. 
Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Making a faking a false peace. It's a war on the humble hearts and bent knees. It's the hammer forging swords into plowshares. It's the right amount of rain and all the crops share. It's the kingdom coming down and be Who's coming down and drying all the tears? She looks like home, looks like home. She knows, she knows. Show me what you saw, show me what you've shown. She sing that song we always sing at the uh, end of services and um, it's a song written by one of one of our own Kelsey Summers um, about the the notoriety of God going around the world and in light of what we just heard what better way to represent God than spreading shalom let's be a part of that good work Mm. 
maybe no upon this earth is saving power among the nations maybe gracious upon his people let nations be glad and sing for joy May you go in shalom. Well, I guess this is part of my day job, but in the evenings, I, I moonlight as a youth minister, and uh, I wanted to show the church what we've been up to the last year. As you guys know, it's been a full year since we were in the same space together, and I have put together a documentary. I say we. There's been a lot of people involved. A documentary about our year apart together as a youth ministry. So I want to invite you guys to watch. The youth and I will be having a Zoom party in addition to watching this documentary. But at 6.15 on Wednesday night, March the 10th, on this YouTube channel, The Heart Boon, there will be a documentary called Our Year Apart Together. And I invite you, church, to be ye encouraged and watch... The question we've been asking is, where has God been this year? And I have no doubt he's been with us. So come and be encouraged by God working in and amongst us. All right, Godspeed. Let's go. 